Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecture writer, and historian. I am here with one of my friends and one of our Grandmaster Scholar Warriors, Tony Browder, historian and archaeologist. How are you doing today, Tony? I'm wonderful, man. It's good to uh, be able to connect with you again. A absolutely, absolutely, man. I know minute. I've... Uh, yeah, uh, yes, it's been a minute. We've talked through uh, Facebook, man, and I've uh, <clears throat> been trying to catch up with you in and out of the country, things like that. Uh, but Tony was one of my first interviews that I did in uh, 2010 when I launched the African History Network mm. show. Um, and we're celebrating uh, our 13th year anniversary. Uh, first launched uh, March 10th, 2010, the African mm -hmm. History Network show. And uh, many people know Tony is the author of one of my favorite books. And we use it in my online history classes. I teach now Valley Contributions to Civilization. If you don't have this book, you have to get this book, okay? Now Valley Contributions to Civilization by Tony Browder. So we want to have this conversation. I was talking to Tony yesterday, uh, Friday, and uh, today. We want to have this conversation dealing with why Nile Valley civilization history matters. And we're going to talk about some African queens. And also with Queen Cleopatra, we're going to put this in a historical context as well. All right. So, um, Tony, uh, let people know just briefly some of your historical background and, and some of your research. Well, um, I am formally trained as an artist, a graphic designer. Uh, my interest in history was peaked on February the 21st, 1977. That was probably before some of your listeners were born. Mm -hmm. uh, that was when I met Ivan Van Sertema, Dr. Ivan Van Sertema was speaking at Georgetown Law School. He had just previously published that came before Columbus, the African presence in America. And it was during that lecture that Van Sertema documented the pre-Columbian presence of Africans from the Nile Valley who had built ships, navigated the Nile River, Mediterranean Sea, and made numerous journeys to the Americas, principally in Mexico, where they brought their cargo of knowledge, astronomy, architecture, uh, engineering, and um, agriculture, and influenced, uh, helped to jumpstart civilization in the Americas, and that they were known to these ancient people as the Omex. And there were at least 20 large heads of these stone carved heads of these Africans that were placed on ceremonial uh, temples and mounds throughout Mexico. And what really blew my mind was when Van Sertema said that these, these Africans who had um, uh, come to uh, Mexico from the Nile Valley, were, were from Egypt and they were black. They were from Kush and they were black. And this was the first time in my life I had ever heard anyone say this because everything that I had read, everything that I had seen in television, everything that I learned in every school that I had attended, even though they were predominantly black schools, taught right. just the reverse. So my mind was blown upon hearing Dr. Van Sertema's lecture and that prompted me to begin to revisit everything that I had learned. Uh, and and I, I discovered what, what I referred to as forbidden knowledge, information, okay. historical information, which has been intentionally withheld from certain populations in order to influence how they see themselves, how they see the world and how they interact with others. So it was my interest in learning this forbidden history that prompted my travels to Egypt, that prompted my, um, my writing, my interest in studying this information. And another major turning point in my life was in September of 1984, when Ivan Van Sertema, along with Charles Finch and A.C. Hilliard, sponsored the Nile Valley Conference at Morehouse College. Right. And that four-day event uh, cemented to me the power of knowledge. And the interesting thing about this gathering was that um, it featured not just you know, African scholars and African-American scholars, but European scholars who also understood that the historical knowledge of the past had been fragmented and had been e e erroneously presented as historical truths. So be a beginning to become uh, aware of the fact that whoever controls your knowledge of the past controls uh, your conception of yourself in the present has really right. framed everything that I've done. So the work that I've done, the writings that I've done, uh, the study tours that I've done uh, are all designed to introduce people to historical information that it may not have been a part of their formal educational process, but information that is critical to their ability 
to determine who they are and how they can move into the world and through the world and better interact with others. Okay, excellent, excellent. Now, uh, in just a point of note, because people are asking, so uh, today is Sunday, April 23rd, 2023. We are live right now. So people are asking that. And you uh, set the tone for this conversation, Tony, because uh, I got to ask you a question about the Omex as well. Okay. okay. Uh, because you, you just mentioned the Omex, right? And I teach about this in my class in, um, in Dr. David M. Hotep's book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. He talks about the Omex, Mandinka, uh, Egyptian or ancient Kemetic connection. OK, uh, I want to have you explain that in just a minute. And then also, uh, OK, CS, thanks for your support. Uh, if you want to support the African History Network, visit our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. Also, you can also you can you all can support us through Cash App, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App and PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Uh, and when you do it through YouTube, they take a third of it, just so people know, because they're trying to support through YouTube. OK, uh, also give your website, uh, Tony, and let people know how they can support your work. And then I'm going to have you answer that question about the Omex. Sure. Well, our website uh, for IKG is www ikg-info.com ikg-info.com that organization turned uh 40 years old 41 years old this past february so we've been doing this for a minute yes. and it's um it's a process that is near and dear to my heart because it's all about raising awareness and as a consequence raising consciousness so with regards to the omega i was blessed brother to have traveled to mexico twice with van certain and to see these Omic heads. And one of the most important parts of our, our two journeys together was that Van Sertema took the group to the home of Alexander Von Wutenow. Von yes. Wutenow was a former German diplomat who left the German diplomatic corps as Hitler rose in power and demanded that every diplomat swear their allegiance to the Nazi party. So he resigned rather than do that and settled in Mexico City and became a historian of note. Uh, Von Wutenow had the largest collection of Omec figurines, terracotta o Omec figurines in the world. And he literally took us through his house, he took us through his museum and showed us these pieces and explained who the Omecs were. Now, what's, what's significant to put this in historical context, Okay, that we've got, we've got these heads and Van Sertema was not the first scholar to write about the African, the pre-Columbian African presence in America. Uh, Leo Weiner was one of the first scholars. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, and even Von Wutenow himself has written extensively on this subject matter. So uh, he's showing us that the selection of the very clay that was used to depict these omics was a dark brown clay. And they had access to various colors clay. So he he, he very skillfully and intelligently showed us the difference between the old the Omec people and the and the Toltec people or the Mayan people based on the type of, of clay that was used to represent these people. So color was an important aspect of his presentation. Another important aspect, man, is that the year I I, I blank I'm blanking on the year, but okay. um, uh, the year that we met him was the year that the Berlin Wall had failed. Okay. So Von Wutno now had an opportunity to go back to Germany uh, because his his family were, were very wealthy and landowners. And so they had he had a prescribed period of time to go back to Germany and reclaim the land of his forefathers that was appropriated during the, the Nazi regime. So when we came back to Mexico the following year, we met with Von Wudenow again, and he told us some phenomenal stories about his trip back home to Germany where he had not been for over 40 years and his colleagues, some of his colleagues who were uh, Egyptologists and shared with us that they had evidence of additional uh, Kushite kings, specifically of the 25th dynasty who are not a part of the historical record, right? So right. to be able to be in the presence of people who have access to firsthand documentation and can see beyond the veil and add more depth and clarity to a history that has been marginalized was was significant to me was critically important to me um and and to to be able to travel with van Sertema, a highly respected scholar who was instrumental in transforming the lives of 
of hundreds of thousands of people uh, throughout the United States and around the world was also critically important to me. But one other factor that hurt me to my heart was to, to learn that Van Sertema was denied tenure at Rutgers University because he had written um, they came before Columbus, the African presence in America. Matter of fact, Van Sertema told me that writing that book was the end of his academic career. And what that says wow. what it to is that there are organizations, institutions, and very powerful people at play who want to make sure that certain information never becomes a part of school curricula. Certain information is intentionally withheld because it will affect the consciousness of tens of thousands and maybe even millions of people around the world. So this is this is no joke. This is this is no game. This is something that I take very seriously. Yes, and you do. One of the things that Van Sertema taught me that I hold on to is that one should never say anything um, in public that you can't validate with at least four sources. So it's not about just popping off. Yes, just, you know, just because <laughs> the mouth poppers, the mouth poppers. No, it, <laughs> it's can't about do that. being serious, and it's about understanding that this is not a sprint. This is a marathon, mm -hmm. um, and that we have to be able to uh, transform the consciousness of tens of millions of people who have been denied the right to read, to write, to reason, and to articulate what they know. Right. So it, it's about participating in an ancestral tradition that we are bound to uh, be heartfully engaged in for the benefit of all the people who never had the opportunity to do what we're doing right now. So I take this very seriously, and I don't believe in getting caught in the fray. I'm mm -hmm. looking at the long game. This right. is a marathon, not a sprint. And it's about shaping the world that our children's children's children are going to inhabit. Um, I also want to share with you, if you don't mind, man. Go ahead. Uh, we talked briefly about this concept of agnotology. Yes. Uh, agnotology. And there's a book by that name that was published several years ago. And the um, definition of agnotology will sound familiar to some of your listeners who are familiar with what you do. Okay. Agnotology okay. Is, des is described as the study of culturally induced ignorance or doubt, particularly the publication or uh, dissemination via the media of inaccurate or misleading scientific data and the creation of institutions to promote disinformation. All right. Okay. So they spell agnotology. Uh, A G N O T O L O G Y. Right. Agnotology. All right. Right. And I'm uh, looking at this uh, this Stanford University Press. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. going to show this on the screen here. Just a second. go ahead. Okay. And and so for those of us who have been studying. Uh, this this uh, form of brainwashing, if you will, or propaganda, mm -hmm. if you will, uh, we should be aware of the book that was written by Dr. Carter G. Woodson in 1933 called The Miseducation of the Negro. Right. So agnotology is a, another word for miseducation. It is the intentional um, marketing of ignorance in order to move people in a specific direction. And so uh, the media, you know, based on my experience and my background in the media, marketing, advertising, and design, I know very clearly that uh, the media, i.e. social media, is the most powerful form of mental manipulation ever created in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. And so we, we have heard about, um, uh, you know, Russians uh, planting disinformation uh, on social media in order to stir up animus in the United States during right. previous uh, presidential elections. Correct. So folk who understand the power of misinformation uh, and the power of being uh, an unseen hand in the internet, in cyberspace, you don't know where these messages are coming from. Mm -hmm. People have a tendency to be, uh, people, um, a large segment of the population is addicted to this information. They're addicted to uh, information that ex excites them and moves them to emote as opposed to moving them to think and process what they're doing. Uh, and so it's so critically important at this particular point in time in history, uh, Michael, that we understand how we're being manipulated by information um, and, and how critical it is that as we move through um, the next, um, the next uh, presidential election cycle, Right. And what happens after that? 
how we will continue to be manipulated. Emotional but buttons will be pushed. And as they push, people will think less. They'll talk more and think less and engage in activities that will be detrimental to the well-being of society as a whole. So it's important um, to choose our arguments carefully and to have your talking points down pat and to know that those talking points are, are grounded in history, yes. not mythology, not, not uh, anger, not racism, but documented facts that can be substantiated. So when people, two people have a discussion, you bring your facts. And, and anyone who is a serious student of history knows that nobody knows everything. Correct. That if more information is being uncovered, it changes our perception of what we thought we knew. So um, it's very difficult to win an argument when you're talking with a fool. Uh, it's very <laughs> <laughs> difficult to win an argument when you're talking with someone who already has their mind made up. There's, there's a saying, my mind is already made up, so don't confuse me with the truth. Mm -hmm. So we've seen here in this country, brother, within the last um, seven years, how misinformation and disinformation have divided this country to the point where we may literally be be standing on the verge of a civil war, right. where, where any sense of, of normalcy and respect uh, between two parties with opposing views has gone out the window. So to watch what's happening right now in Congress is is an indicator of what's happening all over the world it's not just here in the united states it's happening all over the world so it, it's like we're in a fight for uh the the soul not just of america as as certain politicians say we're fighting for the soul of our consciousness we're fighting for the soul of africa and i think if you're going to be engaged in that fight um you have to prepare yourself adequately uh Correct. there is a statement that was made by um, I think it was the U.S. Army in an ad that they did a couple of decades ago. They said that <clears throat> the first battle, the first battle in any war takes place in the mind. Mm -hmm. And the first casualty of any war is always the truth. Right. It's always the truth. So we have to be very clear about what we're talking about so that we can deal with the truth that, has, that stands on solid ground. And right. not the truth that liars speak in order to muddy the waters and to move people into a space where they won't be able to distinguish the truth from a half truth from an all an all out lie. So these are the issues that I think that are so critically important for for your listeners to understand. And it's also the reason why I just finished a, a two part webinar on why now Valley civilization matters. OK, There's certain core information that has to be understood if you're going to engage anyone in any discussion about African history or Nile Valley history. And we've never been given uh, the basic knowledge. So people, there are many people, unfortunately, who have a, a very pronounced presence on the web who read one book and all of a sudden become <laughs> an expert on something that they know very little about. Correct. And, and, Correct. and so dealing with these issues uh, or dealing with the larger issue is important. And that's also one of the reasons why we find here in the United States uh, there is an ongoing effort on the part of certain parties to suppress the teaching of African history, to suppress the teaching of uh, of American slavery. Um, so, you know, what's happening in in Florida or Virginia or uh, Texas is nothing but an effort on the part of a of a certain population to control the historical narrative and to perpetuate a point of view which disassociates them from decades of violence and murder and crimes against humanity. So I understand that. Uh, I understand why they're doing what they're doing because of what they have to protect. So my response to that is not to get angry for our former oppressors for saying that they're not going to continue to miseducate us. We have a responsibility right. and an obligation to educate ourselves. And that's what the Black Consciousness Movement was about in the 1960s, which led to the Black Studies Movement, which has opened the door for us to have this level of conversation today. And there has always been pushback. There's always been pushback. And so we have to learn from uh, the lessons of the past 
learn how our scholars, our heroes and our sheroes were able to work around these obstacles that were placed in their path in order for them to continue to get the message out and raise multiple generations of people who now have a clearer understanding of what history is and why history is so critically important. Absolutely. And, you know, you talked about um, uh, dealing with facts. And I have a saying, those that have been following me on the African History Network show, um, if we disagree, let's disagree based upon the facts and the evidence, not the fact that you don't want to deal with the evidence. OK, mm -hmm. <laughs> number one. Number two, you talk about marketing. So many people know my degrees in business administration with a major in marketing from Wayne State University. The foundation of marketing is psychology. So this is why a lot of this information I, I understand better than many people because of my training and having a background in sales and marketing, et cetera. Um, you, you mentioned the Omex uh, a few minutes ago. I want to hit on this and have you expound on it and then talk some more about Nile Valley uh, civilization and why this history is so important. <laughs> Uh, so many people are familiar with Dr. David M. Hotel, who wrote the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. He's a, he's a friend of mine. I've interviewed him probably 13, 13, 14 times here on the African History Network show. Um, and on page, uh, I'm going to pull up this citation here because we discussed this in my classes also. Uh, page, um, what page is that in this book? Uh, he deals with the, um, Omec, he, do, he talks about the Omec connection and, and what you just hit on. I want you to expound on this, because when we start talking about the um, African presence dealing with the Omex, um, we, we get uh, a lot of uh, pushback or uh, people saying, oh, you, you, you're lying, things of this nature. OK, so he deals with the let's pull this up here. Uh, Mandinka Egyptian Omec connection, Mandinka Egyptian Olmec connection. And I'm going to try to flip over to this slide here. Just bear with me for a second. I got to close out one of these presentations. All right. Let's look at this here. Uh, so he says, let's see here. Let's go to current slide. Uh, a major ethnic group. And now this is from page uh, 82. I think it is of uh the first Americans were Africans documented evidence. A major ethnic group among the ancient Egyptians were the Manding people, a uh, Niger Congo homeland in the general vicinity of the upper Nile Valley is probably as good a hypothesis as any uh, for the origin of the Manding. And let's, uh, let me try to reconnect here. I wanna show this slide. Uh, okay, so we'll do this and Let's go here. Um, all right, resume slideshow. That's what we need. Um, the proto the proto manding migration, the proto manding migration had to have taken place during the African aqua aqualithic period. That was a wet period in Africa that lasted thousands of years at a time when the Sahara was fertile and had river systems and great lake great lakes all right now i'm going to try to okay so go ahead and talk about uh, there's some more here i'll get to but go ahead and talk about the um omec connection because when we talk about the omex you have people who say oh no the omex were they had nothing to do with africa or anything like that who who were the omex and what's the connection between the omex and ancient kemet Sure. Well, you know, um, anytime new ideas are introduced into the academy, uh, there will be those who will reject those new ideas because reputations are, are built on maintaining certain concepts and ideas. Right. So as a matter of fact, one of the foremost Mesoamerican scholars um, was Michael Cole of Yale University, mm -hmm. and he railed mm -hmm. against uh, Ivan Van Surnema and his, uh, his publication, They Came Before Columbus, and the Omex, the fact that the Omex were African. It was Michael Cole who said, and, and there you go, I was gonna ask you if you had any images of an Omex head, this is perfect. Yeah. It was Michael Cole who stated, and this is someone with a PhD in Mesoamerican history who taught at Yale University. Michael Cole said that the reason why these Omex statues 
head, broad noses, and thick lips is because the people who carved those statues didn't have the tools to make thin noses. I've heard that. Thin lips. <laughs> All right. So this that that quote came from Michael Cole. Okay. Uh, Spell his last name, please. Spell his last name. C O E. C O C O E. Okay. Yes. And um, Van Sertema, in describing this particular Omec head, uh, and this is at uh, Villahermosa. I think it's at Villahermosa. Uh, no, 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 no. Oh, God, it, it'll come back to me. Okay. But this is this this particular museum is an incredible museum, man. They have one of the largest collection of Omec heads. And the Mexican architect who designed this museum, I think it is Villa Hermosa. Um, the Mexican architect who designed this museum also designed the Nubia Museum in Aswan. Okay. Right? Um, and, and so Van Sertema, Van Sertema had pointed out that the helmet, the leather helmet that is worn by this Omec personality and several other Omecs is practically identical to the leather helmets worn by Nubian warriors, mm -hmm. right? right? So he's drawn a number of interesting parallels between these cultures. Uh, he's He's got maps in his book that shows the migratory pattern uh, of the Omics from uh, the west coast of Africa who were able to catch currents that brought them over to uh, brought them over to uh, the Americas. And one of the other points that Van Sertema brought out uh, in many of his lectures that people um, want to dismiss uh, or not discuss at all is the fact that these Africans who made the journeys, made multiple journeys, also brought back to the Nile Valley certain products. And one of the products that they brought back was cocoa leaves. The coca leaves, uh, the plants from the plant that is used to make cocaine. Right. And very few people talk about the fact that um, when a examination of the mummy of Ramesses II, one of the most uh, significant kings in Nile Valley history, when a examination was done on the contents of his stomach, they found coca leaves in his stomach, mm -hmm. right? And they only existed, at that time, they only existed um, in, in the so-called new world. So there's so many connections that have been, so much information about these migrations that have been suppressed in academia. So uh, the other thing is there is a marvelous book that Charles French turned me on okay. to, written by a Senegalese scholar by the name of Abubakar Lam. That book is entitled Paths from the Nile. And this book documents uh, multiple migrations from the Nile River Valley into the Niger River Valley. So David and Hotep had talked about uh, before the desertification of the Sahara, uh, this, this region of Northern Africa was, uh, was grassland and you had multiple river systems that ran uh, from east to west. And so if we, if we begin to explore this uh, intercontinental migration of African people from the east to the west, from the Nile Valley to the Niger River Valley, we'll begin to find that there is, there, there's tons and tons of history that is waiting to be rewritten, the uh, artifacts that are waiting to be on earth that will add to the story of African people and the migration of African people. And the only way that that story could be told intelligently is if more people of African ancestry get interested in the subject matter and do the primary research. Right. So, you know, I, I, I hope that what I have done uh, throughout my career has served as a model to encourage others to get involved in, in traveling to Africa and doing the research, documenting what you found and helping to bring this information out of the darkness into the light. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, you talk about primary research, uh, Professor Manu M. Pym, who's a friend of mine as well. He talks about primary research as well. Dr. Linda Jeffries, Professor Jane Small. Uh, those are two of my teachers, Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamene, Dr. David M. Hotel. Mm -hmm. They talk about the need for primary research. Um, is, OK, so, so so this section here, this is from page 82 of uh, the first Americans where Africans documented evidence. And as I said, Dr. David M. Hotel deals with the Mandinka. Egyptian Omec connection or the Manding. Uh, he said the Nile flowed west across the Sahara and emptied into the Atlantic Ocean during very, very ancient times. This would have enabled East Africans direct access to the Atlantic Ocean. The longer route would be to sail to the Nile River north to the Mediterranean Sea and then head west 
to the Atlantic Ocean. When the Manding reached Central America and began mixing with the local population, they were labeled Olmecs. Okay, when the Manding or Mandinka reached the Central uh, reached Central America and began mixing with the local population, they were labeled Olmecs. The Olmecs were supposedly a mixture of the Manding or Mandinka and American Indians or people who we would term, you know, Native Americans or however you want to phrase that. Do not forget that the Manding made up the base of the Olmecs. So the Egyptians or the ancient Kemetic people, the Kemet II, the ancient Kemites, the Manding and the base of the uh, Olmecs are related to each other. So just briefly talk, talk, talk about that uh, because there's so much, uh, there's so many attempts when we talk about the Omex, and we're not saying that the Omex did not have any Native American ancestry or anything like this. We're not trying to take away somebody else's history. We're trying to correct history. Well, so so uh, a couple of things I want to add yeah. to that. Uh, one clarification I want to make is that the Nile Valley uh, flows from south to yes. north. Uh, but within... Um, the, the lower Nile Valley, you had other uh, river systems that flowed from east mm -hmm. to west. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I just want to clarify one thing. So it wasn't the Nile Valley that flowed from uh, from right. east to it's west. Right, it was south to north. The river mm -hmm. that flowed uh, off off of the Nile or fed fed into mm -hmm. the Nile. Uh, so mm -hmm. what what that implies? A couple of things. Those of us who have studied Nile Valley civilization. The Nile River is the longest river in the world, 4,120 miles approximately. Mm -hmm. It ends in the, in, the, in the highlands to the south. Uh, there are two primary sources for the Nile River, Lake Nyanza uh, in Uganda, uh, now known as Lake Victoria, because when Europeans discover Africans, they rename things that Africans Correct. had. Uh, but that's the source of the White Nile. And then you have uh, the Blue Nile, which comes out of Lake Tana. Uh, the Blue Nile is the primary source for 90% of the water that flows uh, from Khartoum north into the Mediterranean Sea through Kush and through Kemet. Uh, by the time the river, the waters from the, uh, the White Nile reach um, Khartoum, where the two rivers join together, 90% of the water from the White Nile has evaporated. So it's not only the water from Ethiopia, but the silt in the water from Ethiopia that made the Nile Valley, the lower Nile Valley, the most fertile land on earth. So Dr. John Henry Clark refers to uh, the Nile Valley as the world's longest and oldest cultural mm -hmm. highway. So we know the people, products, resources, in addition to the water flow from south to north. So when you look at uh, the development of Nile Valley civilization, you'll find that the primary um, science, the primary mythology, if you will, of Nile Valley civilization came out of the South, came out of the upper Nile Valley. And I'll share this with you and then I'll go on to finish answering your okay. question. So the primary mythology of, of, of Kemet and Kush is associated with Asar, Aset, and Heru, who we know better by their Greek names, Osiris, Isis, and Horus. Yep. They're the foundational mythology of, of Kemet. That story of Asar, Aset, and Heru that was instrumental in the founding of, of Kemet in the first, from the first dynasty on, that story originated in Ethiopia uh, at least, at least um, four to, to 6,000 years earlier mm -hmm. uh, among the people mm -hmm. known in Southern Ethiopia as the Omoro people. That same story is there. And as it flowed northward down the Nile, it, it modified over time yes. right, and became slightly interpreted, but it, that is a fundamental story. So you also had situations where if as a Africans migrated from south to the north, they also migrated from the east to the west. So there was this flow, uh, this, this intergenerational transference of knowledge and technology over time and space from the uh, east coast of Africa to the west coast of Africa. And much of that information is now really beginning to come out. Uh, and what it does, the coming of this information will shatter all of the myths about West Africa. And there are scholars now in, in Ghana, Senegal, uh, Nigeria, uh, Cameroon, 
and um, Mali, who are now talking about their ancestral migrations from the Nile River Valley into the Niger River Valley. So we're living at a in an age of incredible discoveries where new information is going to be coming forward. So as part of that migration of Africans from West Africa into the Americas, what we're talking about is the further transference of African knowledge and African technology. So those who have a vested interest in maintaining um, the the uh, the concept of African people as having made no contribution to culture and civilization, they have to suppress this information. Right. Uh, so the microcodes of the world have to stand up. And so what we have to do is we reassemble the fragmented pieces of African history. Uh, we have to be able to look at uh, exactly what you said, the omics. Uh, and, and Van Sertema uh, talked about the fact that the omics the, the, the remains, the physical remains of Omex were found in many of the royal tombs uh, in Mexico and that they comprise, I think he said, about 12 percent of that population. So what we're looking at is an influence of uh, an influx of Africans with um, advanced technology coming into a society and helping to jumpstart civilization in that society. And you also had other people coming from other areas into that same society as well. So uh, as Von Wooten and others have pointed out, there are other people from other parts of the world who made contributions to the culture, to the culture that was established by the Omex. So as we now look back on approximately over 2000 years of world history, we're trying to sift through all of this to get to get to the real story, right? right? And so the main point is uh, we don't have to say that Africans invented everything in, in, in America, that Africans were the indigenous population in America. We don't have all of the evidence at this point in time to stand firmly on the truth to say that, but we can say beyond a shadow of a doubt based on the, uh, the archeological and historical information that we already have at our fingertips, that Africans uh, from the Nile Black Valley played a pivotal role in helping to jumpstart culture and civilization in the Americas 2,500 years before Christopher Columbus was born. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. And so again, mm -hmm. um, I'm not about uh, just, just you know, talking smack just to be talking smack. We talk facts. We talk facts based on uh, the documented evidence that we have. And we also understand that not everybody is, is willing to accept the truth. Right. You know? Uh, and so we teach the truth. We teach what we know to those who are ready to receive it. And we have to assume responsibility for doing that and not leave it to our uh, former oppressor to teach our children, our most precious resource, teach our children information that will transform their consciousness. And with that transformation of consciousness, with them seeing themselves as people with a long documented history, as people with lives that matter, they will do what every culturally conscious person does, and that is tap into their ancestral memory. Right. See, that's really that brother, that's really what, what all of this is mm -hmm. about. Because when we when we look at the, the greater arc of human history, we have to acknowledge a fundamental fact that no people on this planet have been as marginalized as people of African ancestry have been on the continent. Uh, and in the Americas. And part of that mar marginalization is about the usurpation of the historical memory of those right. people. And after the end of this process of enslavement, you still have to continue the enslavement of the mind, right? Correct. So whoever controls a person's thinking controls everything that they're able to do in their lifetime and everything that they're able to pass on to the lifetimes that will come after them. So it's a battle for the mind. It's always been a battle Correct. for the mind. And so knowing your history, going to sources and being courageous enough to say, being courageous enough to say, I don't know it mm -hmm. all, but I'm mm -hmm. learning. As Neely Fuller says, I'm still learning. And as we learn, we get more information and that information buttresses what we already know, or it provides a new kernel of truth that allows us to explore another field of study that expands what we thought we knew. Right. So this, this, is, this is the journey, and this to me is what this process is all about, man. And it's exciting. Yes. It's exciting to be engaged in this process. And it's also important to know that the closer you get to the truth, 
the more your enemies will try to suppress yes. you. Yes. Right? That's when you know. That's when you know you're going in the right direction. So we can't allow ourselves. And, and I'm glad you put uh, Dr. Jeffries up mm -hmm. there again, because just two weeks ago, the powers that be came after his nephew, Hakeem right. Jeffries. Representative right? Hakeem Jeffries. That's not an accident. Yep. That's not an accident that is happening now. And they're bringing up issues that uh, came to the fore in, um, what was that, 2000 and 2001. Mm -hmm. 2001. Mm -hmm. Issues from 20 years ago they're bringing up. Why? Because Hakeem Jeffries represents this phenomenon that I'm, I'm truly beginning to, to embrace and wrap my mind around. And that is the major reason why people of African ancestry are still here. The reason why we have not been exterminated is because of the power that we carry within yes. us. This genetic memory that has been driving us and allowing certain people within our group to overcome seemingly insurmountable odds. So it's not just us doing this, it's the ancestors working through us. And it's the acknowledgement of the ancestors, which has always been our greatest yes. power, our greatest resource. So whatever others can do to make you feel that to be African is to be ignorant, to be African is to be shameful. Deny your African ancestry means that you deny your ancestors, which means you cut yourself off from your only salvation, mm -hmm. right? So, so there, and unfortunately, brother, there are many of us, many of our people who deny that they're African. Correct. Who deny that African people have ever done anything of any significance, who have bought into the narrative, bought into the lie. Those people will be marginalized by their unwillingness to embrace a larger historical truth. And that's, that's on them. Right. Not everybody is going to get it. Not everybody is capable of understanding what is at play. And that uh, are those people who have always been in opposition to the restoration of, of the African mind, the restoration of African consciousness, will always fund those people who will undermine this effort. That has always been the case. That's part of what COINTELPRO mm -hmm. is Count about. Intel's program, yeah. yes. Yes, and, and, and also the use of government infiltrators to undermine organizations that were working on behalf of uh, the advancement of African people. The Black Panther Party mm -hmm. was infiltrated mm -hmm. yes. by, by, by these people. Anyone who saw Judas and the Black Messiah, mm -hmm. right, saw that. And, and that story hit home to me because I'm from the west side of Chicago. Okay. You know, I know about Fred Hampton and Mark Clark. I was a freshman in college when Fred Hampton and Mark Clark were murdered. Right. Uh, went to school with a young lady who was in the house the night of the murder. So to have her give her description of what happened and then to read in the newspaper, the Chicago Sun-Times, or to watch on the news, Mayor Daley, Edward Hammerhand, and other government officials give their version of the story, that's when uh, the covers came off for me. That's when I began to realize that the media lies, yes. the politicians lies, that people have a vested interest in perpetuating a false narrative in order to maintain their power and suppress any effort on the part of African people to free their yes. minds. So these issues, these issues are critical, man. And we cannot, you know, we, we cannot have a short term memory Correct. when we're dealing mm -hmm. with long term issues. Look at what happened in the 60s. Look at the rise of the black power movement, the black consciousness movement and the things that the government did to shut that down, the introduction of drugs into our community. Again, I'm from the west side of Chicago, so I can tell you specifically uh, what happened when cocaine was allowed to come into the community unabated. Yes. What the film, and this is again the power of the media, what the film um, uh, Superfly did to destroy conscious black folk on the west side of right. Chicago. Right, the original Superfly with Ron O'Neill, the original Superfly. Yes, exactly. yeah. Exactly, so I, I was in Chicago, man, when that film yep. came out. And I saw how when the black exploitation movies, yeah, and, and very, very so, quickly, and, and I know we only have a few minutes left here because I know you got to run. Uh, a, a couple of things I, I want to hit on that, but uh, very quickly because uh, people are asking. Uh, also, if you want to support the African History Network, you could do so. Uh, cash app dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App or through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. We have the links on our website, the African History Network, 
Africanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. I put the links there because some people have set up fake African History Network cash app accounts and they've been mm -hmm. stealing money from us. Okay. Yeah. But we have the yeah. actual links there. You can click on it. Uh for to support Tony Browder in the work that he and his daughter Atlantis Browder do. Okay. Go to IKG hyphen info info.com ikg hyphen or dash info.com uh you mentioned uh uh superfly and, and uh, i want to uh talk about that for just a quick minute and then have you connect now valley civilization and history to queen cleopatra put it in a historical correct context okay we're not gonna let that dominate the conversation uh nathan mccall the author Nathan McCall, uh, he had a book out in the 1990s called Makes Me Want to Holler. African-American Man Makes Me Want to Holler. And I read his book and he talked about how in the 70s, the movie Superfly made he and his uh, uh, friends want to sell drugs, to live that type of lifestyle. OK, um, and he ended up going to prison. He became a journalist. I think it was either the Washington, I think it was the Washington Post. He ended up writing for Washington, Washington Post. Post. Yeah, I read his book yeah. and his, his book was fantastic. And I, and I had the book on tape, but that deals with the power of the media. OK, and Dr. Mm -hmm. Leonard Jeffries ha has talked about previously how those black exploitation movies, not all of them. There, there, some, there were some right. good movies, but how mm -hmm. some of those movies showed us in the worst light and promoted drug usage, pimping, exactly. selling drugs, <laughs> things of this nature. And white people profited off of these degrading images of African-Americans right after Dr. King's assassinated in 1968, mm -hmm. Malcolm X assassinated in 65, the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense is infiltrated and largely derailed, okay? And mm -hmm. then you have these movies. So we got to understand that chronology. Um, connect the Nile Valley civilization history to putting Queen Cleopatra VII in the correct historical context, please. Great. So... The, the, the perfect example I can give you is the work of Dr. Asa G. Hill, okay. III, who established a framework for understanding Nile Valley civilization. And he divided Nile Valley civilization into four golden okay. ages. The first golden age was uh, dynasties three through six, when all of the mayor or pyramids were constructed. The second golden age was dynasties 11 and 12, uh, 11 to 12, when all of the great literature, the philosophical literature, the scientific literature, the moral literature for, for the nation was established during that period of time. The third golden age and the longest golden age is dynasties 18 and 19, okay. when Kemet was forced to become an imperialistic nation because of continued intrusions from mm -hmm. the north. Uh, and then you have the last golden age, the fourth and final golden age, which is the 25th dynasty, which is what Dr. John Henry Clark referred to as Africa's last great walk in the sun. It was the last time in history that Africans were the wealthiest and, and most powerful people on the planet. Right. So if you understand that framework, then um, after the the 25th dynasty, and they, there were 30 dynasties in, in, in the history of dynastic Egypt. Kemet civilization fell in 332 BC with the advent of Alexander Macedonia conquering Kemet and turning Kemet into right. Egypt. Egypt is a Greek, Greek word. Pyramid is Egypt Greek. is a Greek this word. Is Greek. So most of the names of African places and things and people have been changed by non-African people. So if you don't know the original names, you'll never be able to understand the history, the culture, uh, the science, the philosophy, and the concepts as they were originally uh, created. Give you. Let me give you one okay. example of that. Pyramid is a Greek word, which means little flat cake, like a pancake. Mm -hmm. The original word for that structure is mir, M-I-R. Right. And the word mir means the place of ascension. Uh, so mir, uh, there, there are no bodies buried in any pyramids of mir in, in the entire Nile Valley, none, zero. So anytime anybody tells you that the pyramids were tombs, that is a lie whether it's an, an intentional lie or unintentional lie based on ignorance. Uh, Mir were always built over tombs. The tombs were underground. So the, the word Mir means the place of ascension, mm -hmm. the place of ascension. And the purpose of a Mir was to facilitate the ascension of the soul buried underneath it into heaven where that soul would be reborn. And they were very specific about where in heaven a soul would go to be reborn. So the first text which documented this journey of the soul into the afterlife 
was carved in the burial chamber of a tomb known as the Pyramid of Unas, right? So it's in his burial chamber where you find the oldest written doc, the oldest written religious documents in the world were inscribed on the walls of this particular tomb that talks about the soul, that talks about the process for the salvation of the soul, that talks about the judgment of the soul and the place where souls go to be reborn. So the framework for uh, Western religions can be found in the Nile Valley. So it's important to reclaim the names. It's important to understand chronology and history. So in that context, yes. Alexander Macedonia conquered uh, Kemet in 332 BC, and, and the word Egypt derived from the, the name Haka Batar, which is the temple of the, of the spirit of Batar in the city of Menefer, which was later renamed Memphis by the Greeks. And so that word Haka Batar became Ajaptus, which was Latinized and became Egypt. Yes. That's how that word devolved. Mm -hmm not evolved, it devolved because it lost its essence through the, uh, the evolution of the word. And so um, once Alexander conquered Kemet, then he became so enamored by the 3000 years of historical knowledge that he had inherited by virtue of conquest. And so he no longer referred to himself as Alexander, son of Philip of Macedonia. He called himself Alexander, son of Amman, son of Amen, the unseen presence of God right. Almighty, which is a which is a upper Nile Valley concept, right? And so the Greek rulers then descended from Alexander's mm -hmm. line, and Cleopatra mm -hmm. is the last of these Greek rulers. So Cleopatra, for all intents and purposes, Cleopatra was not African; she was not comedic in the literary in the literal sense of the right. word. Uh, and, and so my thing is, don't get caught up in Cleopatra. Mm -hmm. There, there mm -hmm. are other personalities of more historical and cultural significance who we should be uh, focusing our attention on. So I would bypass Cleopatra discussion and focus on Queen T, who was one of the baddest queens in human history. Right. She was one of the most powerful rulers on earth. She was the wife of Amenhotep III, and their statue in the uh, Egyptian Museum in Cairo is the largest statue in that building. And anyone who looks upon that statue could see the, the nationality or the race, if you will, of who these two African people were. And it's very clear that we understand the chronology. Um, uh, Queen T was the wife of Amenhotep right. III. Uh, the son was Amenhotep IV, who changed his name to Akhenaten. Uh, and, and Akhenaten's son was the person that we call King right. Tut. So if you understand the history, understand the chronology, you can focus your attention on, on subject matters that are more worthy of discussion than, than Cleopatra. Not to dismiss her summarily, but, but Cleopatra is about as significant as Meghan Markle. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. Right, right. Put context is everything. Right. Context is everything. Right. So look at, and, and there, thank you for that image of Queen T. Now that's a very small mm -hmm. image of Queen mm -hmm. T. And what I would also uh, suggest those of your listeners who, who live in New York, go to the Metropolitan Museum, the Met Museum, and you'll see an image of Queen T in the Met Museum. But that image of Queen T has half of her face destroyed. Mm -hmm. And there was an article that was written in the 1970s that was an attack against African Center scholars. And Asa Hillier brought this uh, knowledge to our attention. The people from the New York Times had interviewed him um, as part of the same debate that folk are having right now about Cleopatra and African history. Um, and A.C. Hilliard showed this image of Queen T. And this image of Queen T, I love it so much because it reminds me so much of my dear friend, uh, Dr. Francis Chris yes. Wilson, with the Afro, the stern yep. look, uh, and a woman who, who was clearly in control of herself and her destiny. So Asa referenced that face of Queen T in the Metropolitan Museum with half the face knocked mm -hmm. off. So they had an opportunity, the New York Times had an opportunity to tell the truth, but they chose not to. Right. And so these are the games that we're playing with. And we have to, you know, be very careful about who we uh, get our information from. We should read everything, but read everything with a critical eye so that you can discern when someone is being deceptive. You can discern when you're seeing you're being immersed into aspects of the truth 
so that you can ground yourself on the truth and not be led astray by arguments or false narratives that is designed to neutralize your your strength, your power, and and, and to waste time. Yes. No, we really don't have any time to waste. Yeah, absolutely. And, and speaking of time, I know you have to run, so I want you to uh, let people know uh, about, you, you told me Egypt on the Potomac tour is going to start back up, uh, give people the website, and then uh, family watching. As soon as we finish with Tony, I'll let you know about my online history classes I teach on Saturdays and Sundays because we have a class today at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Go, go ahead, Tony. So uh, through our through our, our company, IKG, we have been presenting this information for over 40 years. Uh, we've done numerous publications. We have numerous activities. One of our most uh, significant activities is our Egypt on the Potomac field trip, which is something that I created um, in 1986. Mm -hmm. So um, Egypt on the Potomac is designed to show people the Egyptian presence, the comedic presence in, uh, in Washington, D.C. Right. And I've done research. We've been doing this for well over 30 years, and no one has ever challenged me <laughs> based on the information that we put forward to show that America's founding fathers chose examples from the Nile Valley, from Cush and Kimmy, mm -hmm. in order to establish the foundation for what has become the capital of the wealthiest, most powerful nation in human history. So uh, that activity has been curtailed for the past three years because of COVID. But beginning on May the 6th, we will have our regular three hour uh, bus field trip of Washington, D.C., where we will take you through locations, various locations throughout the city and explain the architectural, the symbolic and the mythological elements of our valley civilization, which have literally been hidden in plain sight. We connect the dots and we empower people with the ability to see their history and use that history to transform their consciousness. So anyone can go to our website ikg-info.com. We also have another project that we're going to be unveiling uh, at the Thurgood Marshall Center where we're based in D.C. It's the John Henry Clark Enhanced History Project. This project, uh, we're going to, we have 400 square feet of wall space where we're going to be using uh, information inspired by the work of John Henry Clark to tell the story of people who have been written out of the respectable commentary of human history. And this uh, project is my response to certain historical shortcomings in the National Museum of African American History and Culture, which is a phenomenal structure. The only issue that I have with it is that it begins our history in the basement and it begins our history with slavery. Right. It doesn't talk about who we were prior to our enslavement. Exactly. So the cornerstone, the cornerstone of the John Henry Clark Enhanced History Project is a 25 foot long mural, which, um, illustrates 8,000 years of African excellence and success, an undeniable 8,000 years of African excellence and, this, and success, which was undermined by the Ma'afa, the, the European and, and um, Arab enslavement of African people. But we have come through the Ma'afa, we have survived. Yes. And through the work that you're doing, through the work that others are doing, we are doing our best to bring forbidden knowledge into the community that needs the knowledge the most so that they can transform their consciousness and create a world uh, that is worthy of their children and the children's children's inheriting based on access to the ancestral knowledge and recreating the genius that we were born with. So that's the process, man. And let me just, uh, in closing, let me just share that my good colleague, uh, Charles French, has a new book coming out next month. Uh, it's 10,000 years of Nile Valley history. Okay. 10,000 years of Nile Valley history. So I'm, I'm really pleased to see that there's more scholars, more sisters and brothers who are doing the work and documenting a history that has been suppressed for so long. And all we have to do is read and study uh, and create spaces within our home. Every home should have a life. Correct. Right? The parents <laughs> in those homes spend time reading with your children and having intelligent discussions about how to articulate that history. Everybody pays taxes and our tax dollars are being used in schools to miseducate uh, many children, black, brown, white uh, children in the classroom. Right. So we have an obligation as 
taxpayers to see to it that certain information is accessible in the classroom. And if it's not going to be taught in the classroom, we need to demand of our churches, our fraternities, our sororities, our barbershops and beauty shops to turn those spaces into spaces where we can teach our children and their parents and elders in the community who they are. Correct. So we can transform our consciousness. And, and I'll close on mm -hmm. this point. Um, you know, it, it, I, I'm, I'm kind of peeved that folks are spending too much time talking about Cleopatra. Mm -hmm. And I need to hear folk talk about what's wrong with Megan the Stallion, Ooh. what's wrong with Cardi, Cardi Hey, B. brother, they don't want to uh, have that conversation. Because, oh, let me, let me, just, let me because, just say quickly, and I'll let you go ahead and finish. Dude, the information yeah. I put out about the song WAP from Cardi B and Megan yes. the Stallion. Now, here's the thing. When we do a systems analysis, I went through and broke this whole thing down. And I said they would never have a top white female artist put out sexually explicit lyrics like that because they understand that whatever is disseminated becomes imitated and they have too much respect for white women. But here's the thing. The majority of my criticism of WAP and the whole thing in the video wasn't towards Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion, even though I would say they get 10 percent. The majority of the criticism I had was for Atlantic Records, a white corporation financing this. Because they wouldn't they would not do that for a white woman. And and the baseline says there's some whores in this house and repeats that phrase about 79 times. And in the video, all the women are of African descent except Kylie Jenner. And you have white people to put together an online petition to have Kylie Jenner digitally removed from the video <laughs> because you only protect what you respect. And they saw that white woman as somebody who needed to be saved. You Negroes, you can keep doing that. You can be the whores in this house. This white woman, you too good for that. Go ahead, brother. All right. So, so I mean, but and and that's that's a valid point, and it speaks to exactly the point that I want to make. People who love themselves and love their women and love their children do not allow their image to be exactly. Defined. The other important issue is I travel around the world, brother. And once you get outside of America, you see a whole different world. And what embarrasses me is to see these videos. On, on television stations in Africa, in Europe, in South America. And, and, and I would say this, in all fairness, mm -hmm. all right, if you want to show black women behaving this way, then let's see some white women behaving <laughs> that way. Let's see some Jewish. Let's level the playing field. <laughs> but it's only us because it's about disparaging us and it's about maintaining this ideology of Afrophobia, this fear of black folk, this mm -hmm. disrespect for black folk. And so we have to accept responsibility for that. So I'm not going to let Megan Thee Stallion and Cardi B mm -hmm. off the hook. I'm not going to let them off the hook because they are rewarded mm -hmm. for that by Megan Thee Stallion. Uh, Stallion was was Person of the Year, Time Magazine. They they appear on on Saturday Night Live. They appear on all of these programs. So what that does is send a message to you, uh, to young and impressionable black women, yet black girls. If you want to get paid, if you want respect. Wear weave, wear these fake nails, wear all of these things that deny your true essence in order to be accepted by a community that has never had any interest or desire in you. And so these are the, these are conversations that need to be right. had. Uh, many of these conversations, I think, should be had behind closed doors and not on mm -hmm. the Internet because you never know who's listening. We need to have private conversations and we need to talk about how we can advance the culture and present favorable images of us because the media, as I stated at the beginning of this conversation, the media is the most powerful form of mental manipulation ever right. created. And we're getting played. Right. right. We're getting exactly. paid. So, um, you know, uh, I always encourage people to take responsibility for yourself, to think before you speak. And to think about the long term implications of everything you do. So uh, emotion is all right, but emotion needs to be balanced with intelligence. It needs to be balanced with the ability to articulate uh, what you think and to associate with people who are doing the same thing. The reality is what I've learned over my 71 years of life here on planet Earth is that this information is not for everybody. You're not going to get everybody. Mm -hmm. It ain't about everybody. It's about moving and working with those people who are willing to learn, you know, willing to commit themselves to something greater than their own individual and selfish interests. Right. It's about building for future generations. So that process is happening, brothers. I'm, I'm encountering 
more younger sisters and brothers. When I say younger, I mean folk in their uh, 20s, 30s, and okay. 40s who, who are finally getting it, who are thirsty, who want this information. These are the people that we need to be focusing on. We need to help frame the historical understanding of topics so that they, they don't get sidetracked by these games, by these traps that are set up just to waste their time, right. but stay focused like a laser, do the work, uh, love yourself, yes. right? And demonstrate mm -hmm. that love and how you interact with other people who look like mm -hmm. you and build mm -hmm. something tangible together that is going to outlive you something tangible that can be passed on to future generations. And if you can do that, man, if you can do that throughout your lifetime, then we can say that the day will come when, when our ancestors will return and have bodies to use that will allow them to create heaven on earth once again. Yes. It doesn't make sense to me, and, and I keep saying I'm going to close on this. But. Hey, just take your time, man. I'm, I know you got something to do after this, but take your time. I'm not rushing you, okay? It, it doesn't make sense for me personally, to talk about your ancestors were, were kings and queens if you're acting like fools. And exactly. Jokes, right? Yep. Uh, and the other reality is, is that less than one-tenth of one percent of, of any nation's rulers were kings and queens. The vast majority of people were ministers and prime ministers, were scholars, were researchers, were scientists, were astronomers, were physicians, were healers, were masons, were architects and engineers. They are the people who made the nation. Right. The king of queen was just a figurehead. Right. So, so I, I want to redirect the conversation. I want to redirect the focus on something that is practical. It's just like saying, you know, uh, you want to be president of the United States. Anybody with any sense knows the president of the United States does not run the United mm -hmm. States, right? Uh, and, and so it's the people who comprise this country who make this country what it is. And we know people of African ancestry should understand very clearly that it was our ancestors and their free labor that helped to make this country the wealthiest and most powerful nation in human history. So we have an obligation as descendants of enslaved people who survived the Ma'afa. Mm -hmm. We have an mm -hmm. obligation and the responsibility to use the resources that we have access here in this country to educate ourselves, yes. yep. right? Because what we know shapes the consciousness of African people all around the world. We talked earlier about the black consciousness movement in the 1960s mm -hmm. and the powers that be saw how the black power movement influenced Steve Biko in South Africa. Right. And he replicated a similar movement. It was happening in other parts of Africa as well. So the colonizers had to shut that down and you shut that down by introducing films that divert our attention and have us praising drug dealers and ungodly behavior. And that then becomes the framework with which we see our future. So if we use this technology properly, we have the opportunity to access millions of minds in a matter of minutes and introduce a, a new narrative. That's what this opposition is all about. Yes. Shutting down the conversation, shutting down the power. So don't give your power away. You are the most important commodity that you'll ever possess. Free your mind, model how free people, free men and women are supposed to speak, communicate and move through the planet, work with other people of like minds so that you can build something that will last for eternity. And as we do that, we will make our ancestors proud and we then will be the vehicles through which they would do their best work. Why? Because they did it in the past and we have the capacity to replicate it right now. That's what this whole journey is all about. Absolutely. And up on the screen, I have the famous quote by Bantu Stephen Biko, the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. So we, so we have to take our minds mm -hmm. back. This is what Dr. Carter G. Woodson was telling us in his work, not just in the miseducation of the Negro in 1933, but the work he did with Association for the Study of African-American Life and History of Sala, which he co-founded September 9th, 1915. So, um, all right, excellent. Kind of, we got to bring you back, Tony. I know you got to run. We have to bring you back. Uh, uh, and everybody, th those slides I was showing, those are all slides from the online classes that I teach. Uh, we use uh, two of your books. Egypt on the Potomac and Nile Valley contributions to civilization uh, in, in my classes as well. I introduce a lot of people to you, Tony. This I read this book back in 1994. I just got this new copy last year from Brother Haki Ami Shakur. 
Um, but the, the, mm. my original copies from 1994, the pages were falling out. I had to get a new copy, man. But that book I read for, I read from the broader file first. Then in 94 at Wayne, when I was at Wayne State University, I, I read uh, Nine Valley Contributions to Civilization. It blew my mind, man. <laughs> I haven't been right since. Okay. It, co it corrected <laughs> no, you my have mind. Been right. you have been it, right it corrected since. my mind, man, but it blew me away, brother. So you got to write. This is volume one, man. You got to write volume two. You got about 20 volumes in, brother. man. But you got to write volume two, brother. Well, well brother, that, that's one of the reasons why. I need to use the time that I have left to redirect my energies. I've got a ton of information yes. that I need to get out. Yes. Uh, and so I'm going to be focusing on doing more writing um, and, and continuing to push my daughter out because what, what I have established is a, is a legacy that she's going to continue. Mm -hmm. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, last December, um, I had some, uh, some health challenges and I was unable to travel mm -hmm. to Egypt, take my group to Egypt. So my daughter stepped up and right. did it. Oh, that's you know, good. so to Shout know to that, that we're preparing the next generation, yes. man, is really what yes. this thing is all about. Uh, because we're not going to live forever, mm -hmm. and we can't do mm -hmm. everything ourselves. So we should be training cadres of young people, man, to know who they are and to live that knowledge in everything that they do. That then is how we change the world. So you know, it's, it's a pleasure to be on. The we got to have you back you. soon, brother. Yeah, and I'm wearing the Black Absolutely. Friday shirt because we're in the uh, documentary series from. Um, uh, uh, Rick Mathis, director Rick Mathis, Black Friday, what legacy mm -hmm. will you leave? Okay, all right, Tony, everybody visit ikg-info.com, support Tony Browder, support his uh, daughter, Atlantis Browder, and uh, also support the African History Network. All right, Tony, you have a good day, brother. Hotel. All you, right, brother. peace. Take peace. care, man. Appreciate right. it. Peace to you. All mm -hmm. right, everybody, so that was uh, uh, one of our esteemed scholars, one of my friends for years, Tony Browder. He was one of my first interviews that I did in uh 2010 when i launched the african history network show um i'm going to uh, give you a little information about the online history classes i teach on saturdays and sundays i'm michael m hotel founder of the african history network host of the african history network show i'm a historian been studying history 31 years i'm a researcher lecturer writer historian talk show host you see me on roller martin unfiltered on fridays i'm a political commentator as well you see me on faraji muhammad show the culture uh also um you can support us uh dollar sign the ahn show through uh cash app and also uh, through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Visit our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, or africanhistorynetwork.com. It'll redirect you to our new website because I just bought back my domain name, africanhistorynetwork.com. We lost it, and um, I, just, I, I, just, I just bought it back. So, um, okay, let me see. Okay, I just bought back that domain name. Uh, when you slide, uh, when you go down the uh, website, it uh, has information about our radio show. I'm on 9, 10 a.m. the Superstation WFDF Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we have our social media uh, handles here. We'll be on live uh, tonight, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We broadcast on Facebook and YouTube also. The African History Network on Facebook, Michael M. Hotep on YouTube. We have a PayPal cash app information here, dollar sign the AHN show through cash app and through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. And you click right here. It takes you uh, to our QR code uh, for uh, PayPal. Uh, we have this graphic here. Uh, this shows the uh, our actual cash app tag dollar sign the AHN show SHOW. When you go to it, it says Michael. It may show my picture. There are about five fake African History Network Cash App accounts I've identified. I opened up an investigation with Cash App last year, still trying to get them shut down. So these other ones, like dollar sign the AHN SHO or dollar sign the AHN S, these are all fake African History Network Cash App accounts. They've been stealing money from us. So I teach two online history classes Saturdays, uh, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Maafa. Understand the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach you in school. The slides I was showing you, those are all slides from the online classes I teach. 
We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch them anytime. A year from now, two years from now, you can go back and watch the entire course. We deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. When we deal with the transatlantic slave trade, we can't start our history in slavery. We have to deal with thousands of years of history that leads up to it taking place. Uh, so if you missed our class Saturday, April 22nd, as soon as you register, you can go back and watch it. Class is on sale $60, regularly $130. This helps support the research, helps support the African History Network, helps us broadcast the show. You can click right here. We have a video that gives an overview of the classes. Uh, we have a bundle pack. You can register for both classes that I teach right now. Limited time only $100. It's a $300 value. Uh, you'll get five of my lectures in digital format free. Also, they'll be in the video library. The second class I teach on Sundays, uh, and uh, we're teaching the class today, is going to be 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, black resistance movements from the Haitian Revolution, U.S. Civil War, Civil Rights Movement, and Black Power Movement, 1800 to 1968. And we go through a look at history chronologically from 1800 to 1968, what leads up to the Civil War taking place. We look at the Reconstruction Era, 1865, 1877, uh, Jim Crow Era. Great Migration, World War I, World War II, Civil Rights Movement, Black Power Movement. To understand what happened to us after slavery ended, what were the laws and policies put in place to put us in the predicament we're in today to understand where we need to go from here, okay? So this class picks up basically where the first one leaves off, okay? It's a crucial, crucial class. I put together the curriculum for both of these courses, been studying history 31 years. Uh, we deal with um, this about, uh, in both of these classes, there's about 80 or so articles that we reference, uh, books that we reference, there's a ton of information, okay? Uh, so we're teaching the class today, uh, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, black resistance movements from the Haitian Revolution, U.S. Civil War, Civil Rights Movement, and Black Power Movement. Okay, so you can register for those classes. And uh, very quickly here, uh, I'll show you uh, just a, a brief introduction uh, to understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. And that uh, I've been teaching this class on and off uh, since 2017. Okay. Uh, we use two of Tony's books in the class. Uh, we use two books from Renoko Rashidi as well. Uh, and there's a, uh, yeah, in yesterday's class, there was a uh, interview that I did with uh, Renoko uh, back in 2014. And we talked about Chevalier, Joseph Ballone, uh, who the movie Chevalier is about. All right. So I'm about to re-release that interview uh, to let people hear that information uh, also. Okay, let me show you this here quickly. And uh, we dealt with this. Uh, we just had our class on Saturday, a fantastic class. Uh, Ancient Kemet the Moors and the Ma'afa Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade. Uh, I'll post the link uh, here. Mississippi River. Now, you know, uh, somebody asked about the Mississippi River. You know, Memphis, Tennessee is named after Memphis in Egypt. OK, we talk we talk about this in the class. Memphis, Tennessee is named after uh, Memphis in Egypt. And one of the founders of uh, Memphis, Tennessee, was uh, General Andrew Jackson, who then became President Andrew Jackson. And uh, Memphis, Tennessee sits at the uh, mouth of the Delta, the Mississippi River. And the Mississippi River was looked at to be the Nile River of America. It, it, the Mississippi River is looked at as the American Nile. Uh, civilizations are built along uh, long rivers. Civilizations were built upon uh, along the Nile River. Uh, this is something that Dr. John Henry Clark talked about as well. Okay, now, uh, so there's a relationship between Memphis, Tennessee, and Memphis and Egypt. Now, we can't start studying our history in slavery, even when we deal with the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, we can't start in 1619. I know the 1619 project is out. There's some good information in there. There's some problems with the 1619 project as well. I wouldn't say ban it or anything like that. But um, African people been in the land we call the United States of America going back at least 51,700 years ago. So we can't start in 1619 or the 1440s when the Portuguese get involved. 1441 with Anton Gonzalez going into Mauritania, taking out about 12 Africans, taking, taking them back to Portugal. We have to understand the history chronologically and deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors who entered the Iberian Peninsula today known as Spain and Portugal from uh, North Africa 
in uh, 711 AD, led by Tariq Ibn Ziyad. So in yesterday's class, uh, we talked about uh, the Moors going in, fighting against the Vandals and the Visigoths and some of the things that the Moors introduced into Europe. And it's going to be the teachings that the Moors take into Europe that bring Europe out of the Dark Ages. So when you register for uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach you in school. Uh, you can watch yesterday's class. So this course not only deals with the transatlantic slave trade, but thousands of years of history that leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Uh, August 2016, 19 marked the 400th year anniversary of those 20 and odd Africans or 20 and odd Negroes uh, coming into Point Comfort on, on the White Lion pirate ship. It was a pirate ship. It was an English pirate ship on August 2016, 19 in what would later be called the Colony of Virginia. This year was known as the year of return as many African-Americans were and continue to reconnect to Africa and, and are traveling to Ghana and other West African countries. When we discuss the transatlantic slave trade, we have to first understand that African people are the original people of North, Central and South America and have been in the land we call the United States of America at least 51,700 years. So as we talked about with Tony, Dr. David M. Hotel, the first Americans were Africans documented evidence, his book. His second book came out in October of 2021. The first Americans were Africans revised and expanded. On page 14 of his book, he deals with uh, evidence uh, found in Allendale County in South Carolina by Dr. Albert Goodyear, who's an archeologist at the University of South Carolina. Uh, this was a discovery made in 2004, and they found 13 different types of evidence to to thoroughly document an African presence in the land we call the United States of America going back at least 51,700 years ago. They found artifacts, architecture, campsites, carvings, Egyptian writings, um, footprints and lava, genetic M174, the haploid groups dealing with DNA and genetics, linguistics, painting, skulls, skeleton structures, and tools. They found 13 different types of evidence. This is why we can't start our history in slavery the original people of the land that we today we call the united states of america were african people okay these were the khoisan the khoisan have the oldest dna on the planet they come from southern africa they're the ancestors to the Ainu and the, and the Twa, the short statured africans all right now here's a picture of dr albert goodyear he's a white archaeologist um, at the university of south carolina this is an article from sciencedaily.com that came out November 18, 2004. The name of this article is called New Evidence Puts Man in North America 50,000 Years Ago. New Evidence Puts Man in North America 50,000 Years Ago. The article is still there. You can go read it yourself. You can go research it yourself, okay? Um, radiocarbon tests of carbonized plant remains were where artifacts were unearthed last May along the Savannah River in Allendale County by University of South Carolina archaeologist Dr. Albert Goodyear indicate that the sediments containing these artifacts are at least 50,000 years old, meaning that uh, humans inhabited North America long before the last ice age. Okay, now who were these humans? Were these brown-skinned Caucasians? Were these Europeans? Were these Asians? 51,700 years ago. Who, who, who were these people? There were no Europeans on the planet 51,700 years ago. There were, there were no Asians, okay? Who were these people? The people who we call Native Americans, they didn't exist 51,700 years ago. These were the Khoisan. Now, an October 2012 genetic study published in Science Magazine found that the Khoisan in Southern Africa are the oldest ethnic group of modern humans with their ancestral line originating about 100,000 years ago. The Khoisan formerly called the, uh, by the derogatory term Bushmen, formerly called by the derogatory term Bushmen, are genetically unique by, uh, genetically unique, and no other currently known population had separated so early from our common modern human ancestor, according to the report. Okay, now here are two Khoisan women. These are the short-statured Africans. Okay, now, the Khoisan live mainly in Southern Africa, in territory spanning Botswana, Namibia, Angola, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. They are largely divided into two groups, hunters and gatherers, known as the Sans people, S-A-N-S, and keepers of the livestock, known as the Khoikhoi people. 
The Khoisan languages include the distinctive click sounds that are not found in the languages of their neighbors. So AtlantaBlackStar.com had a good article called uh, Five Ethnic Groups that prove the first humans were black five ethnic groups that prove the first humans were black okay so th this is just a sample of the type of information we do within this class uh it's a 12-week online course we do it thousands of years of history uh we look at archaeological uh discoveries that have come out in the last uh 15 maybe going back 20 years uh we look at the uh discovery of Thomas Heraklion uh, that was discovered, that, that was revealed in 2013. They have been doing the excavation even before then. And this is the lost city of Egypt that was uh, uh, built around 8th century BC, okay, lost for about 1,200 years, the lost city of Egypt. And they found 16-foot tall statues, gold coins. They found uh, dozens of ship anchors, things like this at the, at the bottom of the sea. All right. We deal with different archaeological discoveries like this one coming out of Morocco in 2017. Uh, this one. It, it now, what we see as more and more of these archaeological discoveries come out, uh, we see that the deeper they dig, the blacker the planet gets, the more research they do, the older we get. All right. So this discovery here pushed back the timeline about 100,000 years. And. Uh, people like Dr. Charles Finch, who, to uh, who Tony Browder mentioned, people like Renoko Rashidi and other scholars, they've been saying that Homo sapiens are at least 300,000 years old and not 75,000 to 100,000 years old. So this is an article from NBCNews.com. We're, we're older than we thought. New find pushes human origin back 100,000 years. This is an article from June 7, 2017. I remember the date because that's my birthday. It's not just Prince's birthday. Is my birth date also. Uh, modern humans evolved much earlier than previously thought researchers reported. New discoveries at a rich site in Morocco show modern humans were hunting and probably cooking game animals 300,000 years ago, 100,000 years earlier than scientists have believed until now. So when these discoveries come out, they keep they, they have to keep pushing the timelines back. You know, Juvenile had that song called Back That Thing Up, okay, like 1988, 99. They keep having to back that thing up. They keep having to back the timelines up when all this, when these discoveries come out. The deeper they dig, the blacker the planet gets, the more research they do, the older we get. New discoveries and new dating methods show that, in fact, many of the bones belong to modern Homo sapiens, and, and they lived as far back as 300,000 or 350,000 years ago. Now, the earliest previous Homo sapiens bones dated back 195,000 years ago, and they were from clear across the continent in modern-day Ethiopia, all right? So what they're, what they're seeing now is that Africans were migrating out of the Nile Valley region of Africa much earlier than previously thought. Taken together, the findings show modern humans were dispersed across Africa long before anyone ever thought. So there's so much archaeological discovery, so much information coming out week after week. OK, it's hard to keep up with it. Uh, so we deal with ancient civilizations. We deal with the, the Olmecs. We, we look at this history chronologically. Uh, we look at Carthage and the Punic Wars uh, and Hannibal Barca, the Battle of Cana, 216 uh, B.C., and fighting against uh, the, the Romans and, and fighting against Publius Cornelius Scipio Africanus. And Africa was not named after a Roman general named Publius Cornelius Scipio Africanus. He actually takes his surname after the Battle of Zama in 202 BC, where he defeats Hannibal Barca. And the word Africanus is Latin, which means of Africa or belonging to Africa. So, for instance, if you look at Cassell's Latin English Dictionary, uh, 2000, 2002 edition, uh, page 11 in the entry for a fear or any Latin English dictionary, not just specifically this one. But when, when I was doing my research on language, this was this was one of my sources. Um, Africanus uh, uh, means of Africa or belonging to Africa. And that prefix, the uh, uh, a free, a free referred to a black African people in Algeria and Tunisia. And we know that Tunisia, that that 
region of Tunisia was historically called Carthage, where the Carthaginians were. The Carthaginians are descendants of the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians are descendants descendants of a larger group of Africans known as the Garamantes. So in African People in World History by Dr. John Henry Clark, page 14 and 15, he says the Nile Valley, uh, the Nile Valley's first age of high cultural grandeur lasted until the, the eve of the Christian era. Some aspects of it survived the, uh, the Greek and Roman occupation of parts of North Africa. After the rise and decline of Greek civilization and the Roman destruction of the city of Carthage. So Carthage is destroyed in 146 BC by Rome. The Romans organized the conquered territories into a province they called Africa, a word derived from a free AFRI, the name of a group of people about whom little is known. This was a new name because previously all dark skinned people were called Ethiopians since the Greeks referred to Africa as Ethiopia, which means the land of the burnt face people. OK, so we talk about Nubia or Ta-Nehisi as well. We go through and, and look at an overview of these different civilizations. We deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors. Uh, and look at the origin of the term more. The word more is derived from the Greek word maros, M-A-U-R-O-S, which literally means black or very dark or a very dark color. The Romans adopt the word and call them mari, M-A-U-R-I, like in Maurice. Maurice is in reference to a uh, Moorish boy or a little boy. That, that, that prefix mari is in reference to the Moors. The Mari, M-A-U-R-I, were a Northwest African people who were very dark skinned. The Romans will refer to the region of Northwest Africa as Mauritania, Mauritania. Mauritania is Latin and means the land of the black skinned people. You will also see the term Marish, M-A-U-R-I-S-H. Uh, one of the sources that we use in the, in the class for documentation, now you don't have to uh, buy any of these books to follow along in class. You don't have to buy any of these books, but I use this as reference to document what I'm talking about. Proper documentation ends all conversation. And when we had our conversation with Tony Brada, we talked about documentation, we talked about references. Okay, so if you read um, Golden Age of the Moor, edited by Dr. Ivan Van Sertima, who we talked about a lot in the conversation with Tony, uh, this book right here, Golden Age of the Moor, edited by Dr. Ivan Van Sertima, uh, if you look at uh, pages 527 and 187, you'll see references to this information that I'm citing right here. All right. So this it took a long time to put together the cu uh, curriculum for this class. I've been teaching this class on and off since 2017. Uh, so I've been teaching like seven years. It, is, it, it has evolved immensely uh, over the years. And uh, the class was the. The class evolved from a four and a half hour lecture that I gave in 2014 called Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school. And that lecture was the culmination of about seven years of research. So in the class, we deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors. Um, th this information, all, this class also, I would say, is PG-13. You can use this with your children. And once again, uh, once you register for the class, your access to the course does not end when the course ends. So a year from now, two years from now, you can go back and watch the entire class. It's on demand. So you'll have full access to it. We look at shocking archaeological discoveries that are causing experts to rethink everything. We look at how insurance companies uh, took out insurance policies on uh, slave ships and enslaved Africans on the plantations. We look at Freemasonry, America and the Founding Fathers, origins of the term America and Africa. Um, uh, we look at what is the transatlantic slave trade? What were some of the events that led up to the transatlantic slave trade starting? What role did Christopher Columbus play? A lot of people want to avoid talking about Christopher Columbus. You have to talk about Columbus because Columbus is, is central to the expansion of the transatlantic slave trade. He wasn't the only person, but Columbus is critical 
in understanding the expansion of the transatlantic slave trade and and where he went on his four voyages okay um when did africans first come to the u.s as enslaved african people would deal with that as well because this was before 1619 and even in 1619 most of what we know about august 2016 19 is is incorrect because codified slave laws didn't did did not exist in the 13 colonies in 1619 those those Africans are put into a form of uh, indentured servitude and they're released after something like about five to seven years. OK, codified slave laws first come to the colony of Maryland in 1641. OK, uh, this article right here. Uh, so when you see me like on Roland Martin and filtered and you, you see me on Faraji show the culture on, on Roland Martin's network, the Black Star Network, and you see me break down this history. The reason why I'm able to do this is because of the the extensive research that i do okay this ain't a game and uh is tony said he's like i got two huge stacks of articles this is this is half of one stack of the articles i had next to me uh so i have like thousands of articles printed up here in the office this is continuous research this is this is not a game all right um this is a historical marker at fort monroe and it notes the uh, in Virginia, and it notes the arrival of the first Africans in Virginia. Okay, this comes from a, a, a critical article from VirginiaMercury.com, uh, August 11th, 2019. The name of this article is Much of What We've Been Told About Virginia's 1619 First Africans is Wrong. Much of What We've Been Told About Virginia's 1619 First Africans is Wrong. Um, and then there were Africans in South Carolina in 1526. Now, we're not talking about Africans being here 51,700 years ago. We're not talking about Juan Garrido coming into Florida with Juan Ponce de Leon, the Spanish conquistador in 1513. OK, if you just look at these Africans, there's about 100 of them taken into the South Carolina, Georgia area by the Spanish. Um, in 1526, because the Spanish were here before the English come here. OK, and we know the Spanish were the second ones involved in the transatlantic slave trade right behind the Portuguese. And when you look at Spain and Portugal, they're right next to each other. So this is why they get in Spain and Portugal are right above Morocco. So when we have the Moors going into uh, Europe, this is why Spain and Portugal gets the brunt of that because of where they are located geographically above Morocco. And when the Moors go in in 711 AD, it's, it's referred to the, as the Iberian Peninsula. We know they're going to defeat the Vandals and the Visigoths, and they're going to settle in the southern portion of what we today call Spain. And the Moors refer to it as Al-Andalus, Al-Andalus, which basically means to walk in a spiritual path or walk in a spiritual light. OK, so when we look at uh, uh, this history, this history is so fascinating. And the reason why this history is so important is because what you do for yourself, what you do to yourself or what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard and seen about yourself. OK, your thoughts create feelings, your feelings create actions and behaviors, your actions and behaviors create results. Uh, so before 1619, there was 1526, the mystery of the first enslaved Africans in what became the United States. So this is an excellent article from The Washington Post, WashingtonPost.com, September 7th, 2019. Spanish explorers brought 100 uh, uh, African slaves to a doomed settlement in South Carolina or Georgia within weeks, the subjugated revolted, then vanished. And it's believed they went to go uh, live with Native Americans who were here, and which is uh, kind of a tricky term because you're going to have uh, Africans intermixing with Asians. Asians come here around 3000 BC and their offspring or who we call Native Americans. But we also uh, look at in this class, uh, uh, the, the, did Africans sell themselves into slavery? We look at that complicated history. Uh, a good source on that is uh, Dr. Sylvian Dioff's book, Fighting the Slave Trade, Fighting the Slave Trade, West African Strategies. Uh, so there's, a, there's so much information in this 12-week uh, online course. So visit our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. You can register for it today. 
And uh, like I said, you can use this information with the children also. Um, the there was something I was going to get to uh, quickly here, and uh, I will give you information on the second class that I teach as well. The second one deals with history that directly impacts what's going on right now. Okay, um, so we have this here, and we talk about Tariq Ibn Ziyad in 711 AD. Oh, Christopher Columbus. Okay, so I showed you the slide when we were talking about uh, when we were speaking with Tony Browder because he mentioned Christopher Columbus. Columbus never came to the land that we call the United States of America. OK, it's important to look at where Columbus goes on his four voyages. The. The closest Columbus came to this land is Cuba, which is 90 miles away. All right. Uh, so when we look at his uh, his first voyage, he, uh, now there's a direct connection also because Columbus set sail August 3rd, 1492, and he it took him about seven years to convince King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella to finance his voyages. Now, the, the African Moors lose control of their last stronghold, which is Granada, January 2nd, 1492, in the uh, Moors Granada, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Spanish Granada Wars. OK. August 2nd, 1492, the 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 the, the Spanish uh, expelled the Sephardim, the Sephardic Jews out of Spain. And then August 3rd, 1492, Columbus set sail. So he sets sail on the Nina de Pinta and Santa Maria. He lands in the Bahamas, which he calls San Salvador, which means Saint Savior. Then he became a devil to the people uh, on October 12, 1492. So this is why some people who still celebrate Columbus Day. They still recognize October 12, 1492, when he landed in uh, the Caribbean. He landed, the first place he landed was the Bahamas. He also goes on his first voyage into Cuba, conquers Cuba and Hispaniola. La Isla, uh, uh, La Isla Española, which means the Spanish island. That Spanish phrase is anglicized to Hispaniola. The western third of the portion of Hispaniola is where the Spanish colony of Santo Domingo uh, was. And then the French take over uh, the French fight against the Spanish and take control of the Western third of the island of Hispaniola in 1697 and call it Saint Dominique. And then there's a revolution in the island, in the, in the colony of St. Dominique in 1791. And those Africans are going to win their independence from uh, France, declare their independence January 1st, 1804, and call it Haiti or Haiti. Okay. This is what we're talking about. This is the region that we're talking about. Uh, Columbus's second voyage, 1493, September 1493, he goes into the West Indies and into Puerto Rico or Barriquin, and then Jamaica in 1494. The, the Spanish are conquering all these territories, and you're going to see constant fights between these Europeans who have been fighting and killing each other for hundreds of years. They went from being groups of barbarians, okay, the, the Anglos and the Saxons and the Jutes and the Lombards and the Picts and the Allens and the Franks. They went from being, uh, and the Vandals and the Visigoths, they went from being groups of barbarians to having kingdoms. And then they go from having kingdoms to having nations. And they were fighting and killing each other for hundreds of years. And they will continue with World War I in 1914. In World War II, starting in September 1939, when uh, Adolf Hitler invades Poland, OK, so what's going on in Ukraine right now is in the region of the world where World War II started because Ukraine is bordered by which two countries? Russia and Poland. OK, so what's taking place in Ukraine is is serious because that's the region of the world where World War II started when Hitler invaded Poland like Putin invaded Ukraine. But it was 1939. This is why you have to understand history. OK, now. Third voyage, May 1498, Columbus conquers Trinidad and the Venezuelan mainland. And then fourth voyage, May 1504, his last voyage, because he dies in 1506, he goes into Panama and Honduras in Central America. These island nations have never recovered from what happened to them over 500 years ago. These island nations have never recovered from what happened to them 500 years ago. And Columbus helped to 
uh, lay the foundation for slavery, racism, capitalism, and the exploitation of indigenous people, which would then lead to right Reverend Bishop Bartolome de las Casas going to, uh, uh, he goes to the Pope uh, right around 1517 or so, and says that the Native Americans have suffered enough and they and, and that we need to stop enslaving them and it's and, and enslave exclusively uh african people but also to a lesser lesser extent white people as well he said he says that but it's going to be uh um uh, more extensively african people he said they needed to save the native american souls they needed to save the native american souls okay Slavery comes to the New World. African slaves were first brought to the New World shortly after its uncovery, conquering by Christopher Columbus. Legend has it that one slave was included in his original crew and they could be found on Hispaniola site of present day Haiti as early as 1501. Upon his arrival in the Bahamas and, and he, he arrives in the Bahamas, like I said, uh, October 12th, 1492, Columbus himself captured seven of the natives columbus himself captured seven of the natives um for their education quote unquote education he said on his return to spain however the slave trade proper was known as the slave trade proper only began in 1518 when the first african cargo direct from Africa landed in the West Indies. So this deals with the Asiento de Negros signed in the law by King Charles V in August of 1518, which gave a license to uh, slave trading nations and slave traders to provide Spanish colonies with African slaves. This drastically expands the transatlantic slave trade, the Asiento de Negros. August 1518, signed in the law by Spanish king, King Charles V, sometimes called King Charles I. The importation of African slaves to work in the Americas was the inspiration of the Spanish Bishop Bartolomeu de las Casas, whose support of, of African slavery was motivated by humanitarian concerns. Bartolomeu de las Casas argued that the enslavement of Africans and even some whites, proving that in the early period slavery did not operate according to exclusive racial demarcations would save the indigenous Amer Indian or American Indian or Native American populations which were not only dying out but engaging in large scale uh engaging in uh large scale revolts and re and, and rebellions okay the large scale resistance as they oppose their excessively harsh conditions as a result King Charles V uh, King of Spain agreed to the Asiento de Negros or slave trading licenses of 1518, which later represented the most coveted prize in European wars as it gave to those who possessed it a monopoly in slave trafficking. Well, Bartolomeu de las Casas traveled with Christopher Columbus on some of his voyages and, and he kept a diary. OK, and his diary was turned into at least two books. I read uh, two of his books when I was in college. OK, uh, like Tears of the Indians or Tears of the Indies, something like that. So 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 Co Columbus and De Las Casas are crucial to understanding the transatlantic slave trade and its expansion. So this is why we have to look at this history chronologically. Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamene, who, who's one of my teachers and you heard me many, many of my interviews with him over the years, he says to understand the existence of something, you must first understand the pre-existence of existence. OK. All right. So. If you like this type of information, you can register for this online course now. You can start watching it immediately, okay? Uh, and we have a lot of archive content there. This is uh, Understanding the Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school. How's everybody doing today? How you all like this type of information? Give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like. Now, I got to pace myself because I got to teach a two-hour class as soon as I finish this broadcast. See, you all got me going. I <laughs> <laughs> I have to pace myself. Then I have to do a two-hour radio show tonight, okay? So I'm going to be knocked out after my radio show is over with. Uh, we do our radio shows Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, okay, so ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Kemet won the original names for Egypt. Uh, this is a 12-week online course. This time around, we'll do, um, we'll do 
at least 13 sessions okay it's on sale 60 dollars, regularly 130 dollars. one of the best investments you ever make and it's the gift that keeps on giving if you want to give this as a gift to somebody you can uh you can use this registration with your family uh you can use this with your children also because i would say the content is pg-13 it's not overly graphic i don't do a lot of cursing or anything like that all right and i do a powerpoint presentation with book references articles video clips uh excerpts of interviews i've done with some of the scholars as well register for we have a bundle package you register for both classes for only a hundred dollars so this one and the second one that i teach um black resistance movements from the haitian revolution u.s civil war civil rights movement and black power movement and we do the second one on sundays normally 2 p.m to 4 p.m eastern standard time today we have to do it at 3 p.m because uh i had to do the interview with tony browder and i've been talking to tony about uh doing an interview with him probably like two years and i said so when i talked to him uh friday when i was uh on roland martin's show we were texting back and forth um talking about uh queen cleopatra some other information and i said uh okay so would you be uh would you be available for me to interview you this weekend and he said so we'll do sunday at one o'clock i said okay i'll, I'll rearrange things because uh, i was trying to catch him before he went to south africa a few months ago and uh, we weren't able to do it so i said we gotta i gotta go ahead and do it okay now the so how you all like this type of information give, give us a thumbs up give us a heart give us a like follow us on our uh social media platforms uh uh, youtube michael m hotep i m h o t e p turn on live notifications so you know when we go live uh if you want to support us also uh do it through cash app or paypal as opposed to youtube youtube takes a third of whatever donations we get and they only pay out once a month okay cash app and paypal is immediate so we can use that to cover expenses dollar sign the ahn show through cash app and through paypal paypal.me forward slash the ahn show okay now the second class that i teach and we do this on sundays is uh black resistance movements uh from the haitian revolution u.s civil war civil rights movement and black power movement so i started i put this class together in october 2021 that was the first time i taught this class and the reason why i had to put this class together is because i had so much information that I uh, that I wanted to cover uh as an extension of the first class to really understand this uh history that happened from 1800 to 1968. um I didn't have enough time in uh understanding the transatlantic slave trade to cover this information like it like it should be covered so I had to create this second class so we can go through and look in depth um at this history chronologically from uh 1800 to uh 1968 1970 okay so and we see that this history puts us directly on a trajectory to where we are today all right now uh when we talk about the voter suppression tactics that are taking place in these former uh confederate states when we look at um the uh political violence that's taking place as well uh we see this is remin reminiscent of the uh reconstruction era okay this is reminiscent of the reconstruction era uh 1865 to 1877. okay so i'm going to show you two quick references here and then uh we have to get out of here because i got to teach a class also and i'm about to take a nap sometime today because i got to get ready for uh the show tonight as well um uh, and if there are other people that you want me to interview email me through the website uh the african history network.com or email me at ahn show at the african history network.com if the other people you want me to interview are the scholars 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 email me uh also if you want to advertise with the african history network email us as well our current promotion is uh buy one month uh get one month free and we have the uh, information on the home page of our website as well. So African-American business owners, you can advertise with the African History Network. Um, we have uh, three different ad packages uh, for you to help you as well. Email us uh, through the website or at ahnshow at the African History Network dot com. Whether you have a brick or mortar store or a um, uh, e-commerce store. OK, so if we look at this, so 
the second class here. And let me pull this up here. Um, okay, Black Resistance Movements. All right. So introduction to this class um, in the aftermath of the of the January 6, 2021 insurrection at the U.S. Capitol building. And we know African-American men participated in building the U.S. Capitol building. Many leading historians, many leading historians drew parallels between the violence uh, that we saw January 6, 2021 and the uh, period of political revolution uh, uh, the, the, the drew parallels between the violence that we saw January 6, 2021 and the Reconstruction era. Reconstruction is 1865 to 1877. OK, 1865 to 1877. And this is the um, this was the period of political revolution directly following the U.S. Civil War, which is 1861 to 1865. So this 12 week online uh, course that I teach and developed the, the curriculum for analyzes U.S. history primarily from the African-American perspective, beginning in the period looking at 1800 to 19 to 1856, 1865, leading up to uh, the Civil War and the end of the Civil War and the ratification of the 13th Amendment, December 6, 1865, when Georgia ratifies the 13th Amendment. Uh, we'll look at the Reconstruction Era, 1865, 1877, the Red Summer of 1919, which was the year after World War I ends, and you have about 25 major race riots across the country. Um, we look at World War I, 1914, 1918, uh, the Great Migration, 1915, 1970, six million African-Americans migrate from the South up North and out West. The Great Migration totally changes the history of this country. Uh, World War II, uh, 1939, 1945, uh, the Civil Rights Movement and the Black Power Movement. Okay, so we look at history 1800 to 1968. We start with the Haitian Revolution and the Louisiana Purchase of 1803 because the uh, Haitian Revolution and the Louisiana Purchase, those two events are connected. Napoleon Bonaparte, and we know Napoleon conquers Egypt in 1798. Napoleon is trying to raise money because the, 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 the French are almost going bankrupt trying to fight the Haitians uh, in Saint Dominique in Haiti. So they sell the land that, the, that, that uh, Louisiana has here in the land we call the United States of America, they sell uh, what's known as the Louisiana Purchase, the Louisiana Territory, 828,000 square miles of land for about three cents an acre. OK, and this doubles the territory of the U.S. at the time, the Louisiana Purchase. This is looked at as one, one of the most significant things that uh, President Thomas Jefferson did as president. The Louisiana Purchase of 1803 brought into the United, United States about 828,000 square miles of territory from France, thereby doubling the size of the young republic, the United States. What was known at the time as the Louisiana Territory stretched from the Mississippi River in the east to the Rocky Mountains in the west and from the Gulf of Mexico in the south to the Canadian border in the north. Part or all of 15 states were eventually created from the land deal, which was considered one of the most important achievements of Thomas Jefferson's presidency. OK, but we know France had no claim to the land because there was stolen land from Native Americans and Africans who were here. So you have one thief selling the land to another thief. This is this is the Louisiana Purchase. OK. Um, all right. Now. Let me go back to this other slide and then we have to get out of here. Okay. Cause I, I'll get going. I'll be here for the next two hours. I mean, <laughs> I, you know, this is, this, this is the type of work that I do. So this is, this is my life's passion, my life's work. Uh, it's important to understand this chronology of history from 1800 to 1968, 1970, which brings us to 2023. It's important to understand this chronology of history to get a better understanding of how we got to where we are now to understand where we need to go from here, understand the laws and policies that need to be put in place to, to take us where we need to go. Everybody's talking about reparations, but very few people understand the history of the damage that you're trying to seek 
reparations for to repair the damage of and to seek a legal remedy to a historical problem implies that you need to understand both law and history and unfortunately most of our people don't understand either one of them unfortunately some of this history is repeating itself unfortunately some of this history 